Hello, hello, everybody. I hope you're all having a great day today. Thanks for stopping by. Today, we're gonna to be sharing my experience becoming a father during the pandemic. So I'll be talking about uh, our experience, my wife and I, our experience of uh, becoming pregnant, having a child, and then the first few weeks uh, post-birth. So last year, my wife and I started trying to, uh, started trying, and uh, we were able to become pregnant after uh, after a few months. The pregnancy it, her, itself was fairly uneventful, luckily enough. Um, you know, that's one of those things where, you know, you don't really want to have an interesting story. <laughs> you know, if you have a boring pregnancy, then that's a good sign in my opinion. So we went to all of the appointments, did all of the checkups, everything seemed pretty good right from the get-go. But there was uh, quite a bit of stress and anxiety around uh, birth. And that's uh, something that um, for all of you who are going to be new parents or aren't parents yet, but you probably will be in the future. Um, one piece of advice that I would like to give is to obviously prepare yourself for the birth, you know, educate yourself around the birthing process. Uh, but one thing to also do some research on is the postpartum. Um, so all the stuff that happens after the birth. At least in our experience, nobody really told us about what to expect after the birth. And that was one of the things that we kind of got caught by surprise on. Um, but while Tiny Tater was pregnant, uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, talks. We had a lot of discussions around what are we going to do uh, having a kid you know, during the pandemic, right? Is it going to be safe? What's going to be happening? Uh, just, a, again, a lot of uncertainty on kind of what to expect and what's going to be happening. So that was a big point. And so, uh, you know, my job as a, as a father and as her husband was to try and calm her down as much as possible. Uh, really to try and lower that anxiety level and try to get her to relax because you know anxiety and all that's not a good thing to happen especially while you're pregnant there's already enough going on right and you don't need the anxiety of giving birth during a pandemic uh, to add on top of that right it's, things are already hard enough so don't make it any more harder on yourself so my job as a father and her husband was to try and relax her and calm her down as much as possible so I was trying to find as many ways as possible that I could just help her out uh, for us, I was coming up with a lot of strategy, a lot of communication, uh, kind of a lot of cues on, okay, if I do this, then this means this, so on and so forth. So one of the things that, you know, we had heard was, uh, you know, have a signal, a nonverbal signal during the pregnancy, right? And for us, it was uh, three squeezes, uh, which means I love you. Um, so I'll squeeze her hand, you know, if I'd be rubbing her shoulders, I'd just do kind of three quick squeezes. And that was just our way of saying I love you uh, non-verbally to each other. And that was something that was just a constant reminder of, hey, I'm here, uh, we're doing this together, and everything will be okay. Um, so we kind of ingrained that behavior uh, together. Um, and that was actually one of the things that we were doing quite often uh, during the during the birth was just those nonverbal squeezes, just a reminder, hey, I'm here, I love you. And it helps, I think it really did help. Um, if anything, it was a brief distraction <laughs> from the anxiety um, and everything going on. Now, leading up to, up to the birth, Tiny Tater was experiencing uh, the Braxton Hicks contractions. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's basically a, a fake contraction. It's basically like your body practicing and uh, building up strength to uh, prepare for giving birth. And so she was getting quite a few of those and they were not painful at all. And Braxton Hicks, I don't think are typically painful, but she was getting quite a bit of those. And the advice that we had always heard was, you'll know when you're having a contraction, like you'll know, you'll know, you'll know. And she went in for an appointment and her heart rate was pretty high. And so we were like, all right, okay, that's a bit strange, but okay, uh, we'll go in and do that. Uh, so I'm gonna pause the story there. I gotta drop off some stuff at UPS. I will be right back. All right, and we're back. Ugh, spent way too long in UPS. It's always one of those times when their system is down, 
and there's only one computer and there's a long line of people trying to get service but we are finally out so I believe we left off with uh, Tiny Tater getting uh, Braxton Hicks contractions and I need to pull over because my jacket is still open you know at the time I was thinking you know what it's probably best if I just go with you and let's make sure to bring our hospital bag just in case you know you go into delivery they induce you something happens right uh, because it's time of COVID I plan for everything <laughs> so uh, we went to the hospital, got checked in, and they said, okay, yep, yep, yep we see you had a high heart rate. Uh, did the test again. And that's when uh, they said, you know, your heart rate's pretty normal now. Um, so not quite sure what was going on there. Um, but after they did uh, a little bit more evaluation, uh, that's when they told us, hey, you're in labor. Uh, and so we were like, what? <laughs> we are? We were so surprised because the advice that we had been told was, you'll know when you're having contractions. Like, you'll know when you're in labor. Um, like, it's not going to be a question. And at the time, it was just Braxton Hicks, you know, fairly comfortable, absolutely no pain. Um, nothing so severe. She was like, yep, I'm, I'm feeling it, but very nonchalant. No, no, no no issues at all right and so we were very surprised when we were told we were in labor and we were given two options uh, the first option was you can go home uh, wait for the labor to progress come back when the contractions are uh, within a certain interval secondary option was we can induce you and you can stay here just to speed up the process and that way you don't have to leave so that's what we elected to do we figured you know what we're already here we have everything and chances are by the time her contractions are within that interval where we do need to come back it's going to be the middle of the night <laughs> let's just get this over with right we're already here let's just do it so we elected to stay at the hospital and uh, I don't recall the name of the medication, but they gave her the medication to uh, to basically induce her and put her into more active labor. So time passes. Eventually, her contractions are getting to a pretty reliable, uh, pretty rhythmic uh, pattern. And so then we decided, OK, it's time for the epidural. Person came in, got, did the epidural. I'm not sure if they're an anesthesiologist or if it's a different name for the person who administers the epidural. The whole thing was done in five minutes and all she had was a brief pinch in her back and otherwise she was good to go. The uh, person did an incredibly good job. Um, my wife didn't feel any pain, any level of discomfort, really for the entire delivery. Uh, so they did a very, very good job. Eventually, wife uh, did go into full-on labor and eventually had to start active pushing. And she pushed for four hours. You know, that's one of the things I always tell my wife is you're stronger than you think you are. Um, and she is a soldier. She pushed for those four hours, uh, pretty much every three minutes, push, 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 push. And I did the best I could to help coach her, to be there for her, uh, to echo what the nurses and doctors were saying. Uh, squeezing her hand and squeezing her shoulders three times just to tell you I love you and really just be there for her give her every single thing she could possibly need and eventually uh, Yoshi was born um, and if you don't know Yoshi is the nickname uh, we gave our daughter uh, for the purposes of these videos uh, just because when uh, she kind of babbles and coos, it sounds like Yoshi. <laughs> so that's why, Yoshi from Naruto. Um, so we call her Yoshi just for the nickname. Uh, her, her name isn't actually Yoshi, obviously. But Yoshi was born. Much, much bigger than anybody thought she would be. <laughs> uh, you know, we were all expecting Yoshi to be... Uh, my guess was to be around seven and a half pounds. She came out to be closer to nine pounds, so I won't give a specific weight, but she came, came out closer to nine pounds. Uh, the, to the doctors and nurses, surprise, everybody's surprised. When you look at my wife, and my wife is fairly small. Um, you know, she's five foot one, 
hundred and some change pounds. I put out a nine pound baby. Uh, when Yoshi was born, she was 21 inches. Pretty big baby uh, coming out of someone who's, you know, five foot one, a hundred pounds. And nurses and every, and the doctors were all very, very supportive and seemingly very surprised. No one expected the baby to be as, as big as she was. Uh, we basically stayed in the hospital for another two nights uh, just to make sure everything was good to go, do all the testing, all the postpartum stuff. And, you know, candidly, there were some difficulties. And, and I did, by the way, I did talk to Tiny Tater about what I'm gonna be talking about before. So I do have her blessing to talk about all of this. Um, there are some things I am leaving out uh, because that is really uh, more her story and her experience and not something that um, That's not something that that's not my place to tell her story, right? I can only share my experience as a father um, There are gonna be some things I am leaving out, but um, We did have some challenges. So the specific challenges that we had first was breastfeeding uh, Tiny Tater's milk didn't come in for about a week after giving birth. Um, and that's also including the colostrum. You know, there was very, very, very little colostrum that was produced. We did have to formula feed Yoshi for a little bit just to make sure her weight didn't drop too far. And so the whole postpartum process put on a tremendous amount of anxiety onto, onto Tiny Tater. And it's one of those things where it feeds on itself, right? Because she was already anxious about being a new parent. She's already exhausted from giving birth and being in labor for 28 to 32 hours. And she's very, very, very self-conscious of the fact that her milk isn't coming in. She's very stressed out because now she's feeling like she's not taking care of our child even though she's doing everything she possibly can, which made everything harder uh, because for her, for her when she's relaxed, and now we know when she was relaxed and when her anxiety levels were low, that is when she produces the most amount of milk. Um, and when she's stressed and, you know, from work or whatever, that's when her supply immediately goes down. It's an immediate reaction. It's very, very easy to see the cause and effect of the stress in her supply. Kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was a self-feeding anxiety. Um, so I did my best as a parent and as a father to, and as a husband to calm her down to help support her and again do everything I can so that way her anxiety goes down and that she will be able to do the best she can as being a mother. Um, so we bottle fed her, we did everything that we could uh, to keep Yoshi uh, fed and keep her weight up. You know that was kind of the first major challenge that we faced as parents uh, was getting uh, Tiny Tater's milk supply up. And we, we talked to uh, numerous uh, consultants um, around breastfeeding, uh, everything that we can do, everything to eat, you know, the pumping, every single thing, the skin to skin. And, you know, and despite ev doing literally everything, it took, still took about a week for everything to come in. Uh, but that, that was definitely the first major challenge that we faced as parents and definitely wouldn't be the last challenge we faced. But eventually her milk was coming in to a point where we, uh, only had to use formula. We had to supplement with formula. So she wasn't 100% on breast milk, um, but she only had to supplement with formula. And that was one of the things I would always tell Tiny Tater is look at the trend, right? From where we were to where we are. And don't focus on the fact that we still have to use formula. Focus on the fact that Yoshi is getting fed and she's happy and she's healthy and she's gaining weight and you are producing more milk. So make that your focus. Don't focus on the fact that you're not producing as much milk as you would like to. And then the other thing was just now, you know, people want to come see the newborn, right? And we've got uh, across both of our families, a good number of family members who would want to come and see her. And obviously with COVID and everything else, we had to tell people, no, you know, it's too dangerous. And even if they wore masks, even if they did everything, we'd still say no, because we were we were just being hypercritical and hypersensitive and overprotective. Just because it's so unknown, right? You can be asymptomatic, and we just did video calls uh, to introduce her. And uh, my parents were the only ones, uh, my parents and her parents were the only ones that were allowed to see her. Um, and that was after they had been quarantining for two weeks and after taking a COVID test 
uh, and still wearing masks and everything else. So my parents were the only ones that we allowed to see them. Everybody else, we said no. And then obviously we can't take her out. We can't really go out. We can't do a lot of the fun things that new parents get to do with newborns in public. Uh, just because, again, it's too dangerous, can't do it. So we're stuck at home. Uh, we try to go outside as much as we can, uh, go for walks and stuff like that to expose Yoshi to the outside world and help her with brain development and get her exposed into nature and sunlight and all that other good stuff. Uh, but, you know, there's only so much you can do. But that's okay. We're still focusing on what we can do, not what we can't do. And, you know, another big thing, another big piece of advice for parents is, you know, the baby blues. Be prepared for it. Be prepared for it. Uh, you know, we, we got hit pretty hard by baby blues. As I kind of mentioned before, when Tiny Tater already had anxiety and exhausted and everything else and adding baby blues on top of that, you know, that just makes everything very, very, very difficult. I remember I told her, I wish I could do more because I can't feed her, right? I, I <laughs> you kind of need breasts to, <laughs> to breastfeed. Um, and I can't feed her. Um, so the only thing I can give her is pumped milk or formula. But in the times where, you know, the early times where we didn't yet have formula um, and her milk wasn't coming in, you know, that was a big thing. And I said, I wish I could help. I wish there was more I could do. Um, or at the nighttime feedings, right? Where uh, she didn't really have enough to pump and so she had to breastfeed. And so she would be the one who would have to get up and feed her. And I, I would be up with her um, but just that f active feeding is exhausting and when you're already not sleeping, you're already exhausted, you're already tired, you're already anxious, there's all these other things going on, you're going through this massive transition in your life where nothing's ever going to be the same again and got all of these mixed emotions of happiness and stress and pain, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So be prepared for that, right? It's not all rainbows and sunshine, it's not all... Uh, it's not all happiness. There, there is quite a bit of negative emotions that, that kind of are associated that kind of go on with having a kid. Don't get me wrong, we are incredibly happy and incredibly blessed to have such a wonderful child. But, I mean, otherwise, the hardest things we've had to face, you know, this, these are good things, good problems to have when having a kid. The hardest things we've had to face is really uh, getting her weight up, and getting her onto a schedule and just really learning about her and just understanding what she's asking for when she cries, right? Reading her cues for when she has a wet diaper, when she's hungry, when she's tired and learning what works best for her because every baby's different apparently. Um, so, I mean, that's what really what we've been going through and so uh, Yoshi is four months old now You know, I couldn't be happier with her. And that's also a very unique circumstance of having a child during a pandemic of, as terrible as the pandemic is, it provided an opportunity for my wife and I to be able to work from home and co-parent together. Where normally by now, I'd only get two weeks of paternity leave. So I'd only be able to stay home for two weeks and then I'd have to be back in the office during the day and I wouldn't be able to help out. Or Tiny Tater has to go into work after, you know, a few months. And so she would be away from, from Yoshi and so we have to figure out who's going to take care of her during the day and we have to figure all that stuff out and be away from her and miss out on being able to bond with her as much as we can. So being able to work from home has really allowed both of us to be parents all the time around her and be able to really bond with her and play with her throughout the day um, and not be in the office and just be wondering, I wonder what Yoshi's doing right now, right? <laughs> Or not just leaving it to one parent to have to take care of her during the day. So there's a unique opportunity for us to be able to be better parents and to really take care of her. So, piece of advice for all you future fathers there. You know, really be present for, for your woman. Right? Be, be there. Be present. There's only so much you can do and make sure you do it. You know, if she has to rub her feet, you rub her feet. She has her water, you get her water. You know, there's so much that mothers are going through that we as fathers and as dads cannot possibly comprehend. So we got to do everything we can to help support them. And uh, plan ahead in terms of who's going to do what after, uh, after the baby has arrived. 
you know, who's gonna take care of the night feedings? In our case, I take care of the night feedings, right? So that way, Tiny Tater can sleep as much as she can throughout the night, and I'll get up and uh, do the night feeding with uh, pumped milk or formula. So I'll have that planned out, have that all decided ahead of time, uh, because there's too much to figure out already, and if there are things you can figure out ahead of time, figure that out. Uh, another piece of advice is be patient. Uh, <laughs> Having a kid is simultaneously the most exhausting, exciting, aggravating thing I've ever experienced. Uh, there's definitely times where a baby's just crying, 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 crying. You've done every single thing to try and get them to stop crying and you're tired and exhausted and they keep crying, screaming in your ear. There's nothing more aggravating. But then in the morning when they giggle, you know, it makes it all worthwhile, right? That Just that little giggle, that little laugh, that smile just melts your heart. It just makes it all those sleepless nights, all that exhaustion, all that frustration, all more worthwhile. So just be patient with, uh, with your child and with your spouse. Uh, be patient with one another, right? Everybody's tired, everybody's angry, everybody's exhausted. You know, take a deep breath and be patient with one another. You know, it's very, very, very easy in that tired mental state to just take it out on your partner. Uh, resist that urge, take a step and take a deep breath and just acknowledge we're all tired and, you know, let's figure out a way to get through this. You know, that was one of the things that we had, I had uh, discussed with Tiny Tater before and I'm very, very happy I did was we're gonna be tired. There's gonna be times where we're gonna lash out at each other. Let's just admit it, let's just own it. Uh, but let's understand that when those times happen, it's each of our responsibility to stop and take a deep breath. So of course there's a lot more to the story that I'm, I'm not uh, including in here for the time being. Uh, but what advice do you have? If, you have a, if, you're, if you're a parent, what advice do you have for me as someone who has a four month old, right? What, what else is there should, that I should expect? Uh, what else was there that uh, I didn't mention that was very helpful for you as parents? What's up guys? So if you're a parent, what advice do you have? Uh, what other advice do you have for other new parents or expecting parents? You know, everybody's got a unique experience, so I only shared mine. I'd like for all of you to share your experiences. So if you like what you heard today, if you like what you saw today, uh, if you'd like to see more, um, go ahead and click that subscribe button um, so that way you can uh, be a part of the community and be a part of the conversation. I have other videos on uh, product reviews and what I'm calling moto therapy sessions where we'll focus on building a specific skill set and building a healthier mindset. So I encourage you to check those out uh, as well and leave some feedback. Let me know what I'm doing well. Let me know what you'd like to see. So with that, take care everybody, do good, be brave, take care of yourselves. Peace, see you on the next one.